Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Aisha Armstrong is the co-founder and executive chairman of Vectorus, where she works with B2B companies to productize their services. As part of this work, she advises executives on how to transform their cultures and processes to allow product innovation to flourish. She is the author of the best-selling book, Productize, the ultimate guide to turning professional services into product, as well as the book, Fearless, How to Transform a Service Culture and Successfully Productize. Aisha has more than 25 years of experience launching new data and information service businesses and leading global teams of professionals. Previously, Aisha held senior product leadership positions, both with EW Scripts, the diversified media company, and with CEB, now Gartner, the pioneer in productizing management consulting services. During her career, Aisha has spoken at more than 100 leadership development and executive education sessions around the globe. She has also been cited in numerous publications, including the Financial Times and the Washington Post. And she's a regular guest on podcasts about product management, innovation, and leadership. Aisha earned her MBA at the Harvard Business School and her Bachelor's of Arts in both Women's Studies and Economics at the University of Kansas. She lives in Cincinnati with her family. She is also a certified yoga teacher and believes that teaching yoga makes her a better executive. Welcome, Aisha Armstrong. So welcome, Aisha. How are you? I'm great, Lily. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're excited to have you. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Yes, I am. I am. All right. So tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I think my first leadership position was probably right out of business school when I was asked to lead a P&L, a business unit at the company where I was working. And, you know, it's so interesting because I was a newly minted MBA and felt like I had all of this information, <laughs> but what I didn't have was experience. Uh, so it was definitely a trial by fire. Uh -huh. um, and I think kind of humbled me in many ways uh, as I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but I tried really hard to learn from those mistakes and uh, thankfully was, you know, continued to get more and more leadership responsibility. But that first position where I wasn't just managing people, but I was managing managers, mm. trying to set a vision for the business that I was managing and negotiate you know, company politics. Again, a lot of mistakes um, and lessons learned the hard way. I imagine brand new, wet behind the ears, ready to right. go. <laughs> and you know, a lot of our listeners are new. And I'm sure that they've experienced that as well, or they're on their way. So this is really great that you're talking about this. Is there any particular uh, story you can tell us about how you grew and learned or was humbled? Yeah. So I think I learned that I don't like conflict mm -hmm. and that I avoid conflict. And that probably, you know, is rooted in my childhood and the family that I grew up in. But I had to quickly become comfortable with navigating conflict. So I learned the hard way. So I had two people reporting to me who really couldn't stand each other because I didn't like conflict. My instinct was to just kind of like let them work it out and try to avoid head on dealing with the situation and the interpersonal dynamics. 
that didn't work. <laughs> and I learned the hard way that I had to get involved and that there was actually a way to have healthy conflict and to teach them how to have healthy conflict. But it required me to get very, very uncomfortable with what I didn't like, which was conflict. So that was one story. And then the other one was I went out on maternity leave with my first child and I made a bad decision. I will own that decision for who I had responsible for managing the business while I was out on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And I defaulted to the person's experience and credentials as opposed to the person's ability to effectively lead. It doesn't sound so lucky now, but at the time I was lucky I got four months maternity leave. And I came back to a business that was really in shambles because the person was a very ineffective leader. And I had to clean that up and, you know, really, again, like I said, own that decision that I put this person in charge and they weren't really well equipped to lead in my absence. So that was tough too. So I wrote down those two things that are major things to learn early on, right? So yeah. these difficult conversations is an important skill to acquire. And I'm sure that part of that is how you move now, like understanding that, right? You spoke about humility. When we get humble, we can also grow in wisdom. So I can't mm. wait to tap into your wisdom there. Um, you also said you chose experience and credentials over the ability to lead. You know, these are mistakes that we can make even as seasoned leaders. So tell us what you're doing now. Yeah. So fast forward, my leadership journey has really changed. So rather than being um, kind of a mid-level leader at a large company, I started my own business with a partner six years ago and have you know been lucky to grow the business, but really started with a blank sheet of paper, she and I, in what type of organization did we want to create, not only for ourselves, but for, at the time, our future employees. And we put a lot of thought into the type of corporate culture uh, and work environment that we wanted to create based on our own experiences. And what's been fascinating about that is kind of balancing staying true to that vision and that initial why for the company and our business and the financial realities of trying to run a growing, thriving business meeting payroll each month, making sure that we're satisfying our customer needs and so on. So it's been, you know, the, the journey of a small business leader and it's been incredibly rewarding. Uh, but again, also one where a lot of lessons learned the hard way. You're not kidding. And that was a big shift for you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so it was. Typically when that happens as a catalyst, there's something that occurs or something that clicks in us, where we say, oh, I need to live in my purpose. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, great question. So both she and I were, you know, at the point where we were mid-career, so 20 years of work experience, and felt like the timing was really good to go out and do something on our own. So we had well-established professional networks, really good track records, as well as the financial security to take a risk, like, you know, leaving a stable job and a stable, nice paycheck and start our own company. And I think that we had also had personal life events that made us realize that, you know, we don't have an infinite amount of time to do these things and really wanted to make the most of the precious time that we do have and didn't want to wait any longer. So I was fortunate in that my business partner is a very good friend of mine. And at the time she lived down the street from me and we would walk on our lunch breaks together and talk about, you know, if we were to ever launch a company, the two of us, you know, what would we do? What would it look like? So this had been something that we had been talking about for a while. And then the stars just aligned in terms of our motivations to take the risk and the leap to do it. 
Well, you know, I love your growth because you started talking about how you, it was difficult to have difficult conversations. <laughs> and then you moved to a risk taker. Like that's big time growth to be in that space where this could be conflict in all areas, but you did that. Yeah. And I will definitely say there were things that helped me along the way. So the year that we started the business, I was also getting my yoga teacher training certification. So I'd been practicing yoga for about a decade and was getting the training certification to deepen my yoga practice. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we really focused on as part of that was kind of our spiritual alignment. Mm -hmm. And were we aligned with our values in our work life and our home life? and so on. And that was one of the kind of big questions that I kept coming back to that was a motivator for wanting to start my own company. And then the other thing was that we spent a lot of time uh, talking about uh, fear and, Mm -hmm. you know, how our brains are wired for fear because thousands of years ago, we needed fear to keep us alive, but that we overestimate the risk of things. And we don't spend enough time thinking about, you know, the positives. So we spend time thinking about like what could go wrong rather than what could go right. And it really, that mind body practice of yoga and kind of deepening my yoga practice gave me the confidence to move through that fear, push through that fear and start the company as well. So I think that mind body practice really helped me. I love it. You know, it's interesting every time someone mentions fear and fear is something that we do need to talk a lot more about because it's in us, even as leaders, even as seasoned leaders, it pops its ugly head up. Every time I look at fear, I always look at perfect love drives out fear. So it could be love of self. I love myself enough to confront this situation because I see what could go right. And I want that for me, or I want it for someone else. And so I'm always looking at where is it that I need to grow in love? That's a woo-woo thing for some people in organizations and culture, but I always bring it. I always talk about love and connection to people and love of self, which is super, super important. So I'm excited to learn about your organization where I can connect with you. And I heard that you wrote a book as well. So tell us more about that. Yeah. So Building off of what you were just talking about with fear, my company, it's called Vectorus. We help organizations primarily who are services organizations, so who have historically made their money through people and trading time for money. Mm-hmm. And we help them think about how can they productize their services? So how can they standardize what they're doing, price it, package it in a more standardized way, and perhaps even tech enable it? So it doesn't require as much human time to deliver. So the first book that we wrote talks about our methodology that we use with our clients to do this. And it's called Productize. Is that something you coined? I mean, is that a word? I I think it's a made up word. I mean, other people were using it before we used it, but we certainly talk a lot about it. And I think if you Google it, we're still the first thing that comes up. But okay. no, I was not the first one to, to coin I that. Like Thank like you. That. And then what we found, Lily, was that this wasn't about, you know, teaching organizations, you know, more about technology or how to create a really good innovation process, you know, how to do lean product or agile or things like that. What we found was really at the root cause of why this is so hard to do was fear. And so the second book that we wrote is called Fearless. And, you know, it's so interesting. You were talking about the way to work through fear is perfect love. We wrote this book called Fearless, and it's all about the culture change that you need to make in order to successfully transform your business. And I wanted to use the word love, but I was concerned that people would think it was too (laughs) woo-woo. So that fear and being fearless and kind of working through fear is something that we end up talking a lot about with clients, usually not, you know, in the first conversation, right, but right. once we dig into, okay, what's been so hard about productizing your services? What's been so hard about you know, new innovation at your firm? Fear is one of the things that commonly pops up. So you go deep. 
You did, you did, right? you I, didn't, I didn't intend to. So, you know, I'm not a behavioral economist. I'm certainly not an organizational psychologist, but it just kept coming up, you know, company after company, like, why is this so hard? And it's because they're afraid of cannibalizing their services revenue, or, you know, they've been defining their professional worth and value their entire life by their expertise and their network. And so to take that and productize, it can be really threatening to how somebody sees their worth and their value. You know, they're so afraid of showing a client something that isn't perfect, you know, something like a half-baked idea. Well, the only way that you innovate is by getting a lot of ideas out there and experimenting. And if you're holding yourself to perfectionistic standards, you're not going to be comfortable experimenting and certainly not quickly. So talking about fear ends up being something that we do with a lot of our clients, even though that wasn't our original intention. Isn't that interesting? So, you know, organizations are made up of people. People are deep. You know, if we want to really effectively create change, something that's significant, that we've got to be heart to heart and have those difficult conversations that I'm sure you've become great at, which is Beautiful. Now, let's say I'm an organization that's listening in. I'm excited. I want to learn more about what you do and how can you help me? So how can I connect with you and what would be the first steps that I should take? Oh, great. Yeah, good question. So we have a website. Uh, it's vectoris.com. That's V-E-C-T-E-R-I-S.com. I'm also on LinkedIn um, and love to get connection requests. But usually the first step we do is to try to understand what are their goals. So most organizations that come to us have read at least the first book, Productize, and they're interested in the strategy of productization. We're like, great. Okay, why? Why do you want to productize? Is it that you want to get out of the feast or famine of cycle of your services business? Is it that you're having a hard time attracting new talent? So you're trying to figure out a way to grow without adding additional headcount. Do you want to exit the business? And will this provide a higher valuation? Or are you in a professional services business that is starting to be affected by generative AI? And Mm -hmm. you realize that if you don't start to figure out how to tech enable what you're doing, you may be disrupted and out of business. So understanding that why is a very, very important first step because everything then flows from that. Yeah. And even, you know, when I think of leadership, often organizations start to grow and they just don't think how important leadership is. They're at the helm, they're ready to go, but they don't have a team. We get to a point where we don't deliver the results. We want the team to deliver the results, but it takes an investment in our culture and in what you do to get there. So really important work. And I love it. So vectorist.com. Make sure you tune into that. Now shift happens, right? Mm -hmm. And so as we grow and learn and things start to change, what are some things that you've done? What are some either advice, things that have helped you navigate these changes or crisis? Yeah, great question. So one of the things is involving people and not involving people just for They call it buy-in, right? (laughs) But involving people because I don't have all of the answers. So example from our own business, we have been trying to drink our own champagne and productize how we work with our clients. And that's a pretty big shift for us. And so certainly as, you know, co-founder and leader of the organization, I have my own ideas on how we should do this. But I've also invested in building a phenomenal team of people who have experience that I don't have, life views that I don't have. And I wanted to genuinely get their input into what should this look like as we drink our own champagne and productize our business? And what are some of the kind of foreseeable challenges that we might face and how might we overcome those challenges? So trying to make that as much of a conversation with my team and not just kind of having them give input, but then having them own their ideas. So for example, one of the things that we've been working on is how do we create opportunities for companies who are productizing to talk to other uh, leaders who've gone through this themselves and ask them questions. Mm -hmm. 
And there are a lot of different ways that you could do that. You could have, you know, conferences, you could have webinars, you could do kind of recorded interviews. And one of our coaches on our team, she saw another business do office hours. And she was like, oh, this is how we could do it. We could advertise that we're having these office hours and set them up, schedule them for, you know, certain times, let all of our clients know, and then they can opt in to whether or not they want to come and ask questions of the person who's going to be at the office hours. I was like, great. Okay. I love this idea. You get to own it. (laughs) So not just her giving me input, but then her getting to run with it and implement it. I love what you said, drinking your own champagne. It's the, uh, you know, newfangled version of walking your talk, right? Yeah. Uh, There's integrity in that. And there's so much power. I love that you do that, that you work through it, that you make sure that you're productizing. That's powerful. Now, Aisha, as a lifelong learner, what are you learning right now? Oh, so lots about generative AI. So this is an area that hopefully everybody knows, like exploding every day, things are changing and there are new tools that are coming on the market. And certainly because we work primarily with professional services firms, so law firms, accounting firms, architecture, engineering, marketing, consulting, so on, they are all kind of in a panic right now about how generative AI is going to disrupt their businesses. And, you know, the first thing I do is I tell them, look, I am not an expert in generative AI, but I am an expert in helping you think about where are the best opportunities to use it and how to get your organization to transform, to take advantage of it. I also have to to be credible and to be using these tools myself and to know about them. And because it's changing so quickly, Lily, I mean, this is probably a good hour to 90 minutes per day that I spend, you know, reading what's coming out of my Google News Alert, subscribing to free trials for new tools, trying to use them in as much of my workflow as possible, talking to other people about how they're using it. So that is where I've spent probably the last nine months doing most of my kind of professional learning. Now, the other area that I'm really interested in, which is probably no surprise given my yoga background, is continuing to explore mindfulness techniques and how to use them in professional environment, not just a personal environment. So that's another area where I try to do, you know, as much development and reading and going to workshops and things like that. Your effectiveness is exponential when we address the whole person, right? An organization really is an organism made up of people. And when we address the whole person, then we up-level that whole organization. It's like working with cells in biology. You're working with cells. You're making sure the cells are healthy so that the whole organism is healthy. And so absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Now, when you think of leadership today, what most concerns you? And what are you Mm. hopeful about? What I'm most concerned about is the tenor of discourse right now and the lack of civility in communications. And I am concerned, especially for my children, that our leaders are not setting a great example on how to do things like have healthy conflict or how to communicate respectfully with someone when you don't agree with them and how to depersonalize problems and work together and collaborate to solve problems. So that is my deepest concern right now, not for my organization, but I think for all of humanity at this moment. Yeah, it's a real concern for sure. Now, as someone who does what you do, what are some things as leaders that we can do to start to shift that? You said it earlier, perfect love. Number one job as a leader is to demonstrate love for the people that you're leading, whether it's your employees, your customers, your family. And if you can do that, everything else will follow. Now, that's not romantic love, but it's, you know, treating people the way that you want to be treated. It's respecting people, even if you don't agree with them. It's about 
showing concern for their humanity, what's going on, you know, in their personal lives, not just their professional lives, and wanting to help people feel like a sense of belonging, you know, and I just say to everyone I talk to, look, if you can just lead with love and, you know, I think it's Brene Brown. She says, you know, open heart, strong back, right? Like everything's so much easier, but it's, it's hard right now when you have leaders at some of the highest levels acting in ways that are counter to love, who are using fear to lead when you don't have interpersonal relationships, when, you know, everything more and more is done online. And so it's easy to kind of depersonalize people, even, you know, dehumanize them. It's hard. And so I really think it's not complex, but it is hard to do. You know, it's hard. Absolutely. Um, You and I do similar work because I do work with organizations as well. I find that if I'm not careful, I can get depleted. Mm -hmm. because there's so many needs and there's so much love for sure. You know, one of the things I anchor myself is in that energy of love. I do love people. I love Mm -hmm. people. But when you walk into an organization or when you connect with an organization, then you start to see all the needs, Mm -hmm. right? And you want to meet them, right? So I know for me, I have to reset and I have to get to a space where I am energized. Otherwise, I'm no good for anybody. So, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm sure there are listeners who feel the same way. (laughs) Hey, I have a lot of love. They're excited. But one of the biggest things is self-love. I've got to replenish my energy because otherwise I'm not going to be of any use to anyone else. Yeah. And Lily, this is another one where I learned the hard way. So early in my career, you know, that newly minted MBA wet behind the ears, like I thought I could work my way out of problems and I would just, you know, burn the candle at both ends. I had a really difficult time with people pleasing again, because I didn't like conflict. It was very hard for me to set and keep boundaries. Certainly have grappled with my own perfectionist tendencies I'm turning 50 this year. So I think I'm finally, I know. (laughs) Yes. I think, you know, hopefully midpoint of my life, I'm finally at a place where I feel like I've figured it out. And for me, it is self-care, self-love is boundaries. And I have to be very clear. And now I know like how much time do I need to be outside every day in order to feel like my cup is full? How much physical activity do I need in order to feel like I have enough energy? How much sleep do I need? What do I need to eat? How much time do I need to spend with loved ones? How much time do I need to spend by myself? All of those things have taken me 50 years (laughs) to figure out, but I'm finally at that place. And two years ago, I went part-time in our company because I felt like my real gifts were not in the day-to-day operations but they were in the thought leadership and the setting the vision and that I'm best able to do that when I have more free time outside of work to be outside, be in nature, be physically active. You know, my children are almost out of the nest. So I'm trying to spend, you know, the last few precious years that I have more involved with them or at least available So all of those things I've been able to do, but it took me a long time to figure out. Important to do. I mean, I I experienced burnout in my thirties because, you know, the same thinking, although I didn't avoid conflict, I was very intentional about having conversations, but I was a little too intense. (laughs) I was the opposite of you probably, (laughs) Um, which, which, you know, can create a, you know, a whole bunch of problems, but anyway, but you know, you learn, right? Hopefully. Right. Yeah. Um, so great. All right. So we have a surprise question from a former guest watching Yanu, who is amazing. She wants to know what is one leadership failure that turned out to be the biggest lesson for you? Yeah. I mean, besides the ones that I've already mentioned, I think underestimating what people will give you if you ask for it. Mm. And this is a lesson I had to learn a couple of times. So first, um, it was when I was running that business unit for the first time. 
I didn't think I could ask for more budget to meet my goals. And then I found out after we didn't meet our goals, almost met them, but we missed, that had I put forth a business case for additional resources, I probably would have gotten it. Mm -hmm. And then right before I started my company, I had a job with a large Fortune 500 company leading a data analytics business for them. And I went in to resign because I was going to start my company. And they asked me what I was going to do. And I told them and they said, oh, can we be your first client? And I didn't even think that that was an option. And, you know, it's just, I don't know if this is a woman thing or what, but I always end up being surprised that like, oh, if I had just asked for something or thought bigger, I probably could have gotten it. And I'm that- clear, right? About what you need. Yeah. We don't, we don't get because we don't ask. Right. Or we don't think big enough. Mm. Like we think too small. And yeah. that's something I'm still working on. It's like, how can I think even bigger? And one of our advisors, she's like, you know, rather than talking about how can you grow at 20%, what would it take to 10X your business? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, right? But that's a really good question. And I feel like it's that type of boldness and then asking for it hmm. is something I'm still working on. Beautiful. I think a whole bunch of us are working on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. So as a listener of this podcast, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? I always want to know what people are reading. I'm a big reader, so I love to know, and not just what they're reading, but what have they read recently that has really changed how they act? And that is a question because I'm always looking for good book recommendations. You know, you value time. So do I. I only want to read the recommended books. Yes. That makes sense. All right. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Again, I love to connect with people on LinkedIn. So Aisha Armstrong, feel free to send me a LinkedIn request. And um, no, this has just been such a great conversation, Lily. Thank you so much for having me. I will make sure to connect on LinkedIn. And we have so many things in common. Oh my goodness, we can talk for hours. But we'll close here. Aisha, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. You're wonderful. <laughs> It's easy to love you. Oh, thank you. And I wish you the best. Oh, thank you for having me. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.